So, uh, hello everyone. Um, thank you, Jim and Abner, for inviting me to discuss uh, this paper. And I apologize for not being able to be in person with you uh, today. Um, it's a little bit odd to present to myself, but I assume that you hear me and see uh, well. So, um, I uh, was very excited to read and uh, discuss this uh, very ambitious paper. So, just to um, set the stage, so um, one of the defining characteristics of going public is the increased disclosure and transparency that it induces as firms uh, transition from private ownership. So it increases investors' protection by mitigating adverse selection and therefore lowers the cost of capital. And therefore that should attract more companies to list. So it's a win-win for everyone, right? But some argue that disclosure requirements may be too prohibitive and may in fact dissuade firms from going public or push firms to delist. Um, part of that is the compliant co compliance costs that may, may be too excessive or simply increased concerns around imitation and short-termism that may lead, that may basically limit the ability of firms to innovate and pursue long-term investments. So the fund, the fundamental question, which I think is really a fundamental question in corporate finance is whether disclosure requirements are too costly. Do these induce this kind of regulatory overreach? And so what are the implications for that for firms? And there's a, an exist, there are various existing approaches that rely on uh, reduced form estimates, uh, self-reported surveys, but these have significant limitations. And um, this paper, uh, provides um, a, a novel and new approach to study this question by relying on firms' revealed preferences. Basically um, exploring whether firms tend to bunch around regular, regulatory thresholds that influence their disclosure requirements. So the paper does a lot, and I'm saying that in a positive way. So it has, um, um, it covers a lot and it, it actually builds really nicely and um, Chiron described it very well, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to highlight the bottom line where estimating the marginal costs from bunching, um, they extrapolate these results to the universe of public companies and then uh, draw conclusions about the overall disclosure costs that represent about 4% in present value of the median firm's equity, which I find to be actually very substantial given that the potential positive effect of the cost of cap on the of disclosure on the cost of capital, the fact that still it costs so much um, is quite um, surprising. And um, they also find that these costs are associated with seven percent decrease in the likelihood to go public. Again, uh, this is within a sample of VC-backed companies that are more likely to go public, and um, that's uh, net of the benefits associated with the cost of lower cost of capital. All right, so um, I have a few comments. Most of them are going to focus on the later stage of the paper. Um, so first about the, uh, so, so this is the bunching evidence. So a, a, as you can see, this is in the time period where there's no um, regulatory requirement around this threshold, you know, the, this, the density is pretty smooth then in the bunching period, you see this big drop um, in the density of firms. And um, you can see that if, if we look at the bean just before the threshold, it jumps by about 3%, um, um, as the, which is nice evidence for bunching around this regulatory uh, threshold. So the first question that comes to mind is basically how many firms do we have around these thresholds? And, and by the way, I should just mention that, you know, this evidence is also consistent with other threats or that the authors um, explore. But then the question is, how many firms do we have here? And given that we see roughly in the bin before the, just the, is closest to the threshold, we see a 3% jump. So um, for example, for this threshold, we have a few hundreds firms uh, around this threshold, 3% of them ultimately uh, ends up with a very small number of firms based on which we are effectively going to extrapolate the disclosure costs for the universe of publicly listed firms. Okay, so this is something that is worth um, having in mind when we are going to discuss the extrapolation here. It's more of an external validity question. 
Um, and then what do we need to assume here to, uh, to interpret the bunching evidence? So remember that what we're comparing here is uh, this smooth uh, density around the threshold for the period of 97 to 2011. And then where we see this drop, uh, we're actually looking at a very different time period of let's say 2012 to 18. So we need to, to hope effectively that um, the only reasons that leads to this drop is associated with this particular regulatory requirement and it's not associated with other regulatory requirements. It's not associated with other things that change during this very different time period. So this is just, uh, we need to um, ass assume that and, and hope that there are no unobservables that drive this kind of bunching. Other than that, the fact that they're using three different thresholds is actually very comforting. Um, there might be, uh, there are other uh, thresholds that the authors mentioned in the paper that they're not exploiting around sales, which could be even uh, strengthening the evidence. I think that it would be interesting to look at the dynamics of leverage as you get closer to the point in the year where um, the threshold is being determined just as another evidence of um, bunching. And what I would like to know is basically how these firms around these thresholds look like relative to these firms. What exactly are we comparing just for the sake of more transparency? And then so we could better understand how we are going to extrapolate this um, further. So the next thing I want to talk about is the inferences of the marginal bunching firm. So essentially what uh, we are assuming here is that in the model we have the manipulation costs and the manipulation cost is basically the cost of being further away from the optimal capital structure. So the threshold is determined based on the public float and the further away we are from this public float, it means we rely more on leverage and we're the, we, we are suffering from a cost of uh, um, deviation from this optimal capital structure. So basically um, this is just a function of the public float and then we're assuming here uh, that the benefit from uh, lack of disclosure is fixed for everyone. Um, what this allows us to do is basically to say, well, the firm simply optimize along the public float to determine, um, you know, uh, to determine what is the margin of firm um, um, around this threshold that is willing to manipulate. The problem is that firms are not just manipulating based on the public float, they're actually manipulating the decision or the impact or the benefit from disclosure um, that is here just kept fixed is going to be determined by a host of other characteristics, such as the concerns from imitation, um, the need to avoid short-term pressure, or firms may be inclined to hide some information. And um, also firms that have cheaper access to that, they may have um, lower cost of manipulation. So there's a host of other characteristics that may influence the decision of firms to manipulate and try to be below the threshold. Therefore, that may bias who is exactly the marginal firm that we're estimating. And then the question is whether these kind of omissions are going to induce bias on what's the cost of disclosure for the marginal firm. And, and these omissions are also, you know, may influence our extrapolation exercise. So the way that the author are extrapolating here um, is basically um, assuming that the disclosure costs for a given firm is a combination of fixed costs, which is basically the disclosure cost of the marginal firm, plus a variable cost that is proportionate to the public float of any given firm. Okay, so again, the disclosure cost here is just a function of the public float. But again, the disclosure might be influenced by, the, by a host of additional firm characteristics, such as the pursuing risky project, imitation, competition, and all of these other things. And the, then it begs the question of how these omissions may influence our extrapolation. Um, for example, this function suggests that the higher public float you have, the greater the disclosure costs um, that you are going to uh, suffer from. But in fact, it could actually go the other direction. So smaller firms may be more sensitive to disclosure just because they are more likely to innovate. Um, 
so then it might go the, the omission of that factor may may actually um, change uh, significantly the extent to which the way that we're extrapolating the disclosure costs here. Um, and then just to on top of that, the additional complexity is that these marginal costs are basically estimated based on a very small number of observations. And then we're extrapolating really broadly across all public firms and then later also for private firms. Then um, I'm gonna end with uh, just, a, uh, just a slightly more general point here. So, uh, which is about ex how do we extrapolate from uh, bunching estimators? Um, to more aggregate policies. So, so when firms go public, they're essentially going to be grouped with others who have high who are other high disclosure firms. So you can imagine that there's this kind of disclosure externalities. The more firms, if I'm bunch of a group, if I'm associated with a group of firms, um, and my association is through index funds and all this. If I'm associated with a group of funds that are high disclosure, then there's going to be less adverse selection. There's going to be more trust for investors to be to engage with the stock market. It might increase stock market participation, and all firms may benefit from uh, more liquid stock and cheaper cost of capital. So, so this kind of uh, it gives rise to some some kind of disclosure externalities. Now, as long as everyone comply and disclose, of course, I would be willing to pay to legally avoid disclosure. I still benefit from these disclosure externalities, but I, by manipulating my public vote, I can get away from uh, disclosing as much. So in a sense, you can think about the parallel that as long as everyone takes the vaccine, one may be willing to pay to legally be exempt from taking it. Now, the problem is that, can we extrapolate that to a world where this local willingness to pay, um, can we shift that from to a, and extrapolate from that and generate inferences when it comes to aggregate regulatory shift that reduces disclosure to everyone? So, so when you move from private to public, it's basically shifts the disclosure to everyone and not just locally. So if everyone provides less disclosure, then the damage may lead firms to be willing to pay to increase disclosure, not to pay to avoid disclosing. Um, so it's the same, again, the parallel that if everyone gets an exception from the vaccine, I may, be, I may be willing to pay to ensure that everyone does take it. Um, and um, the avoidance benefit is gonna be very different if everyone is avoiding that. So in other words, the question is how should we think about extrapolating from local manipulation around the threshold to aggregate policy shift that everyone that affects everyone's behavior. So I'll just mention that again. So, so reducing disclosure locally around the threshold may be value enhancing to the deviating firm, but reducing disclosure globally could be very damaging to the same particular firm. So, so then it kind of like begs the question of can we really extrapolate from these local bunching to overall aggregate market implications and changes of disclosure that may affect everyone um, uh, around the listing decisions? All right, so overall, so um, let me conclude. I, why I think this is a great paper, I think that applying bunching estimators that is um, used typically in public finance to study disclosure questions is, is great. And I think and I, I hope that others will follow and apply this in other settings uh, when it comes to corporate finance. I think that illustrating that firms are willing to sacrifice value to avoid disclosure is also really fascinating. Um, where do I have some quibbles around the paper? With the paper is, is more around this uh, extrapolation and the broad conclusions. I think that where there might be some room for uh, more work. So overall, um, great paper. I highly recommend everyone to read it. Thank you.